It's been a while since I've made a Sonic video, hasn't it? I did a video on the dumpster fire of Sonic Colors Ultimate when it first came out, but that was more or less a showcase for some much more interesting fan projects if I'm being honest. But that was still about six months ago, so I asked you guys what game Nick, Elliot, and I should play for our weekend gaming session through a poll. But really, the polls were more of a formality to gauge what specifically you guys wanted, and as a side note, I appreciate those of you who voted for Sekiro, but I already made a video on Sekiro back in 2019 when it came out. I've recently been going back through it after Elden Ring left me wanting something more, and good lord. You're as beautiful as the day I lost you. You guys might be getting a follow-up for it at some point, let's just say that. But, sorry, back to the poll. Sonic Heroes is one of those Sonic games that I was there for the announcement and the launch. I might have been a dumb kid at the time, but I still experienced it. My grandparents took my brother and I on a weekend trip back in 2003. The exact details are a little fuzzy, but I found a magazine in a game store and thumbed through it to find an article on a new Sonic game called Sonic Heroes. I was so excited after I saw these images of Sonic and friends, and oh my god, Shadow is back on a team with Rouge and Gamma was back from the dead, I begged them to buy me the magazine and I spent the whole drive back home just looking at those pictures and thinking about what kind of game this is going to be. Then for Christmas that year when my parents asked me what I wanted, I kept saying the same thing. All I wanted was Sonic Heroes. But that stupid kid didn't know anything. He really thought this was Gamma. I didn't know anything about a release date or anything like that at the time. I just saw the game and didn't understand why I couldn't play it now. But once again, my parents proved that they are goaded with the f***ing sauce. On Christmas morning, I ran downstairs and found a copy of Mario Kart Double Dash. But inside the case was a demo disc with a playable teaser of Sonic Heroes. I still don't know to this day if they knew that they had defied the laws of time and space for me and my dumb baby brain, but I couldn't believe it. I got to control three characters at the same exact time. Sonic and Shadow were designated as a speed character. Tails and Rouge could lift the entire party over gaps and ledges as the flight character. Meanwhile, Knuckles and newcomer Omega could deal massive amounts of damage as the power character. I was blown away by all of the options I had to overcome challenges. The demo came with two stages, one playthrough of Seaside Hill as Team Sonic and one playthrough of Bullet Station as Team Dark. I played those two stages over and over again until the day finally came when I could get my hands on an actual version of Sonic Heroes. And at the time, it lived up to the hype. It was the next Sonic game. I was going to love it either way. It did its job by cementing itself as another great game in my memory. And because of those great times I had with the game, I've been sort of a Sonic Heroes apologist for a while. As time went on, of course all the negative takes had come to the surface in the day and age of the YouTube critic, but I always stayed my modest but positive course. Oh, it's not that bad. The game actually looks fantastic. The control isn't that bad. Combat isn't that bad once you get the hang of it, and so on and so forth. My friend Nick has also been in the same boat as me, remembering it on decent terms, but my other friend Elliot has always been far more negative. He is so openly vocal with his disdain for Sonic Heroes that Nick and I constantly poke fun at him by saying we're going to sit down one day and play through it and make him watch. And on April 1st of 2022, my partner had booked a trip with her friends, so I took the opportunity to propose a boys weekend at my house. They both accepted and we began a journey, mainly to listen to Elliot's negative reactions in real time, but also to see how this game has evolved since my naive days as a drooling kid with nothing on my mind but getting to play Sonic Heroes. I was ready to be blown away, just like I was when I played that demo disc. It's okay, Nick, don't die. I know I'm not taking my own advice! <laughs> oh, the combo! <gasps> 
I was such a stupid kid. Okay, I do want to start with some positives because this game isn't absolutely terrible. First of all, I think the game looks fantastic for the GameCube. I love the color palette. It can be a little loud at times, but more often than not, these levels are a joy to look at. Egg Fleet is one of the most stunning to me personally, with that grand opening sequence of free falling through this big blue sky into the massive armada of airships. Grand Metropolis and Power Plant have such fun choices with the standouts being the green platforms and the blue energy walkways. And Seaside Hill is emblematic of the game in general for good reason. The music is also just... Oh. Heroes has got to be one of my favorite Sonic OSTs throughout the entire series. It doesn't beat out Adventure 1, mind you, but it's pretty high up there. Power Plant's fast arpeggios give the level a kinetic energy that just makes it that much more fun to blast through. Ocean Palace's theme can't help but give you this feeling that the team is running through a beach resort or something. Like this would be a great theme for your next beach vacation. And then there's my favorite song on the soundtrack, Mystic Mansion. This song is an achievement. How it shifts from synthy pop with Halloween vibes to this sinister distortion guitar to crash the party out of nowhere. goes harder than it has any right to. God, June was just on the next level with this one. But I don't think it's a particularly hot take to say the game has good music or that it looks good. So allow me to hit you with a genuinely unheard of take regarding Sonic Heroes. This game has the best homing attack in the franchise. I'm not kidding. I think this thing, especially at level 3, feels so good to use and connect with. The initial whoosh of the character's specific aura to start the move is a nice touch, and then the impact and bounce off of an enemy just has a really nice feel to it. I've always been a big sucker for the aura that each character gets when they curl up into their little jump balls. What can I say? It's the little things that impress me. But for as much as I like the way the homing attack feels, this game has issues that go so much deeper than that. And frankly, a lot of them just ruin the entire experience for me. And I think the thing that it can't help but always come back to is the control. Let's start with the speed character, shall we? With Sonic, Shadow, Amy, and Espio, you can reach speeds that the other members of the teams could only dream of. Each character has a homing attack, and each character can create some sort of gust of wind for swinging on community stripper poles, disarming shielded enemies, and stunning certain types of robots. And they can also call their teammates to push them forward for some not-so-quick acceleration with the Rocket Excel. But this is where the differences start to arise. Sonic and Shadow are basically identical with the ability to do the light speed dash when in front of a trail of rings and this little dive kick move, but I never really bothered with it. Amy can spin a short distance after a jump helping with some aerial control, and Espio can turn invisible after his whirlwind attack, making enemies ignore him even if they're being attacked by Espio, allowing him to pass through certain hazards, and giving him a long-range shuriken projectile. Next, we have the flying characters. Conveniently, the flying characters are all exactly the same in typical gameplay. The only differences they see are in the very few times that you can separate from the other two members of the team and use their underwhelming unique skills. Tails and Rouge throw dummy ring bombs, Cream sends Cheese out to attack, and Charmy throws that ass in a straight line. Finally, there's the power characters. After pressing the B button, each power character will gather up their teammates. Knuckles will use Sonic and Tails as boxing gloves, Omega will load Shadow and Rouge into his arm cannons, Big will sit Amy and Cream on his shoulders, and Vector will stuff Espio and Charmy into his mouth. In this state, every power character can jump up and slam the speed and flying characters down at enemies causing big damage. Or they can gather up and use the triangle dive to awkwardly glide, or use the fans to ascend to the next area. Knuckles and Omega both have a 3-hit combo that can be executed on the ground, and depending on what level they are, will have a more destructive finishing move. Big and Vector don't have a combo, but instead fire the speed and flying characters while on the ground, and then finish with a move that gets stronger the higher their level is. They can also do a slam attack when in the air, and if the speed and flying characters are out of commission. Okay, now that we know what they can do, I can tell you how useless it all actually is. Cutting to the biggest issue here, a good homing attack can't save the speed characters from all feeling extremely slippery. And honestly, almost every action the speed characters can perform leads to stress and nervousness. Trying to go fast in Sonic Heroes is nerve-wracking. You will constantly find yourself rubbing against walls, accidentally running into enemies, and most commonly, careening off the side of a cliff. 
the Lightspeed Dash can't help but feel like it decides when it wants to work. And that's when it doesn't decide to bug out completely. F***ing... What, what is the timestamp that is going in the f***ing video? <laughs> With the flying characters, level 3 Thundershoot is probably the most effective method of attacking in the game. But it feels very amateur the way both of your teammates can get stuck attacking enemies, which leaves you to just kind of hang out in the air waiting for them to return. It always feels a little clunky the way the team drops like a sack of bricks when the flying meter runs out. I want to give the benefit of the doubt and say that this immediate stop to your momentum was for ultra-tight platforming, like the devs had a very specific distance in mind for what they wanted you to be able to travel. But then that kind of goes out the window when you look at how much distance you can get when you time a jump perfectly before you start to fly. It just makes me wish we had Tails' flight mechanics from Adventure 1, or even... Jesus, I can't believe I'm saying this, 06, where after he got tired, he still dropped with his speed he had accumulated. He started descending, sure, but this allowed him to still make amazing jumps across large distances. But here, it feels so restricted. But again, rather than in a way that was done for the sake of some very well-designed, tight platforming, it feels far less carefully calculated. The moment-to-moment -moment feel of Sonic Heroes can most accurately be described as clumsy. Having a system where AI-controlled partners are required for a player to use essential moves and attacks might not have been the best idea. Formation changes can only happen if that member of the team is available. Of course, the AI-controlled characters will be constantly flying around the stage defying all the rules of the game to get back into formation, but when they happen to get hurt, they're out of commission for a short while. And this happens a lot. The previously mentioned moves like Thundershoot and the power types using the other two as ammunition to hit enemies leads to stalemates a lot of the time. Of course, they don't take any real damage, but they do become unavailable. This makes formation changes impossible for a short time. So if Omega just so happens to take a hit just before you want to switch to him for a tough enemy, you better hold on while he goes through his recovery period. On the surface, I understand that they wanted the characters to behave like they always do, but in practice, this hurts the flow of the game big time. Making the players stop and either stall for time like an idiot, or making them survive in a situation that was not made for the specific character to overcome just feels broken. I want you to think about a game where a special team attack is necessary to defeat a big enemy, and the enemy is only in a dizzied state for a short period of time, but your AI companions can just get knocked down for seconds on end during the battle through no fault of your own. That'd be pretty frustrating, wouldn't it be? The power types have similar issues. Vector and Big both have initial attacks that rely on sending their teammates at the enemy. The same thing can happen, however. If they just so happen to get injured in the line of duty, the power character is stuck just kinda hanging out for a second until they can return. Knuckles and Omega's initial two hits make them lunge forward, but this sudden change in speed in a straight direction can cause you to fall off the sides of cliffs a lot of the time. It seems to have subtle auto-targeting, but it's slightly helpful at best and the cause of dramatically increased blood blood pressure at worst. Combat in general is just so nerve-wracking. It feels good to get homing attack chains when fully leveled up. There's a satisfying rhythm to it. But if an egg pawn with a lance just so happens to turn the right way, the lance can stop you dead in your tracks, which feels more like a frustrating oversight than an intentional design choice. Shield enemies can be chores to disarm because of their invincibility. You might think that you could get some actual damage on them if you attack them from behind, but you actually can't because they have this magical shield barrier all around them for some reason. This problem has three solutions for disarming them. A level 3 homing attack is typically the safest, but also the only one with a prerequisite of leveling up. Each speed character's tornado move can work, but with potential snags. Amy has it the best with a tornado projectile, while Sonic and Shadow are slightly more at risk to take damage after an attack by simply colliding with the enemy, depending on where the animation spits them back out. And poor Espio's whirlwind isn't practical at all since he's always above the enemy and will simply fall back down on top of them. The final option is to simply break it with a barrage of attacks from the power character, but if the battle is taking place on a narrow walkway, it's very easy for knockback to get the best of you. Knockback is the leading cause of death in Sonic Heroes. If it's not a narrow walkway battle with some ranged enemies, then it's some absolute poo poo caca doo doo on a grind rail. In a rare instance of complimenting Sonic Adventure 2, I wish grinding worked the way it did in that game. I think that grinding was the best the series has ever been in that game. There was 
was actual skill involved. In addition to crouching to gain speed, you could fight the bend of the rail to go faster, and if you lean too far, you could actually fall off. A legitimate mechanic to master. Not a one-way ticket that makes me sweat every time I need to swap rails. Rails have become less nerve-wracking as I've played this game. Using the slow flying characters to help correct mistakes is good, but it's way more fun to go fast. And with that, there are still those few instances where the game decides that I've had it too good for too long and throws me into the abyss. I dig the concept of something like Final Fortress and its laser segment, but if something just so happens to go wrong, I can't help but feel immediately exhausted. While stages like this can be a bit frustrating, on the whole, I think level design in Heroes is decent enough. Plenty of instances where that signature multiple pathways design is on display. Granted, it's rarely ever as radical as something as a whole new section of the level, mind you, but you are rewarded for quick thinking. And set pieces like the beginning of Eggfleet always stay with me long after I turn off the console. Levels that lean on progression dictated by choosing which character's abilities lead you to a specific route are a bit less exciting than something like a 2D Sonic stage. Because when these levels do what they tend to do and get a bit more linear, it's hard to not get bored. Rail Canyon and Bullet Station being centered entirely around grinding to smaller stations can't help but breed this type of design. The absolute lowest point of the game for me is always Casino Park. The amount of control that you don't have over the characters while on these pinball boards is enough to make me want to pull my hair out. It's not awful for something the length of Team Rose's level, but it gets unbearable for campaigns like Team Sonic or Team Dark, where the stages can sometimes take upwards of 10 minutes. And you know, for all the horrible controls, inconsistent level design, wonky combat, and some marathon stages, it really isn't that bad since you just get to pick which team is your favorite, right? <laughs> I just get to pick my favorite team, don't I? <laughs> it would be awful if I had to play through all of these stages and boss encounters. literally four separate times to complete the game and unlock the last story segment! Mmm, Tylenol, I need. Mean. So I probably should have explained this earlier for my non-Sonic obsessed underdwellers, but each team is representative of a different difficulty in this game. Team Rose is considered to be the easy mode, Team Sonic is considered to be the normal mode, Team Dark is supposed to be a hard mode, and Team Chaotix is something else entirely that we can discuss in just a minute. Who's this broad? In pretty much every Sonic game you can think of, Sonic's campaign is always the one that has the most care put into it. It was the campaign that the game was balanced around. It felt the most fair and it felt like the most indicative of the game's overall concepts. But here, Team Sonic's levels can take nearly 10 minutes to complete, which is like 6 or 7 minutes more than I personally need. Team Dark is even worse than this though with the last stage taking me over 15 minutes to get through this time around. Team Rose feels like the ideal way to play through the game if you want a baseline experience. Their levels take 3-5 to five minutes, my personal sweet spot for a level in this franchise, the length of your average song as I always like to say, not to mention that I like their moves a lot more. Amy has a short mid-air spin that can be great for closing the gap or saving herself at the last second. As I mentioned before, her tornado is a projectile, so using it on enemies is safe and pretty entertaining to do against a group of enemies. The few times Cream is alone, Cheese is just as much of a nightmare for enemies as he was in Sonic Adventure too, and I just like the moveset that Big and Vector have more than I do Knuckles and Omega. Team Chaotix is a bit more tricky though. They're essentially a designated mission mode for this game, but still required to complete a playthrough and see the final campaign. But their levels usually involve finding a specific number of items or things in a stage. And going back to it wasn't as bad as I remember, but that doesn't change the absurdity of some of these objectives. Why crabs? Why am I finding hermit crabs on this beach? It doesn't take too long because they're all on the main path more or less, but a lot of the objectives are just flat out silly. And a lot of the time they're hidden in dickish places. Like the chips on Bingo Highway. This one that's suspended in midair right after you break this glass floor is just mean. The camera switches to give you a cinematic view of your fall instead of a view of the objective that is on the way down. Instances like this are why levels have these purple flowers everywhere. So you can warp to the start of that particular challenge if you just so happen to miss it due to, say, a cinematic camera versus a helpful one. Thankfully, some of the objectives are more lenient, like breaking capsules in Bullet Station, for example. There are more than 30 capsules in the stage, so you can afford to miss a few, which is appreciated. But some do not, such as the key collecting of Hang Castle, and playing Hang Castle by itself is already a decently sized endeavor. But you know what? I would take this over this any day of the week. 
Playing these campaigns back to back is just tedious. It's what makes people so sick of this game. If Team Sonic had slightly cut down levels and a reworked moveset, it would be the best starting campaign. Then the other teams could be unlockable rewards for completing it, and there could even be tons of side objectives tied to special obstacles that only other characters can access, enticing players to go back through rather than forcing them. Laser gates for Espio or purple flowers for Charmy. You could very easily have some of those pull bars that someone like Omega had to specifically access. But hiding optional challenges that the player can find hints to in the main campaign would be so much more exciting to find and work towards. Rather than the absolute grind that this game's four full length campaigns boil down to. When you were a kid, you put up with the shortcomings and poor design choices because one, you probably didn't know any better, and two, because you had to. Assuming you were like me in the sense that you were stuck with one game for a long while before you got a new one, you got good at these games and you learned how to work around the flaws so that you didn't have to deal with them. I figured out that using the speed character's tornado move on the Red Falcon robots made them vulnerable to other attacks, but I still had to repeatedly do that attack over and over to make the fight progress. I figured out that standing still with Knuckles allowed him to consistently attack right in front of him to take out the big hammer robots much easier, but you still had to be careful to not touch any part of them so you wouldn't get hurt. I learned that tilting the character fully to one side before making the switch to another rail is the most reliable way to do the technique, but it still has a tendency to screw you over from time to time. I learned that spamming Thundershoot was a really easy way to build up the team blast meter and stockpile it for annoying enemy encounters, but that still stopped me dead in my tracks for a minute to do so. I figured out that attempting the lightspeed dash was best done when headed in the trajectory of the rest of the ring trail, not just touching the beginning of the chain. But for all of the ridiculous workarounds I pocketed for this game as a kid, I never once realized how much this game asks of you for just an initial playthrough. A decent investment for a kid to make, sure, but today? Nah. There are far better Sonic games readily available for you to have to put up with the things that this game will force you to do. And I know that there are a few things that I didn't cover here, but it's things that don't really matter to me. Multiplayer isn't anything to give credit to, the extra missions aren't really anything, the special stages are absolutely horrendous, because guess what, the control is absolutely horrible. And for as cool as it is the first time, the final fight against Metal Sonic isn't that great. It'd be cool if we had the super powered version of Team Sonic to use in the real game, but that's too much to ask I guess. And look, I don't want to sound like I hate this game, but the length of every team's campaign coupled with the monotony of doing them back to back just is not fun. Hopefully the team will learn from their mistakes and come back with a refined take on this new style of play and make an experience that will blow- Thank you so much for watching all the way to the end. It means the world to me. I um I, I just realized after recording this that I didn't once talk about the story, but I technically did last year. And you can check the card up top for a video where I rank my top three favorite Sonic the Hedgehog stories. So that's pretty fun. Also, um, hello to all of the new subscribers that have joined us due to the overwhelming success of that Elden Ring video. I guess I would just like to say welcome aboard. I don't usually stick to one topic from video to video, but if it's something I love, you can believe I'll want to talk about it again at some point. And as far as what's on the docket next, two secret projects are being worked on, one can be expected in May, definitely, and I'm really excited about it, and the other one will be a QC on a childhood game from the Xbox 360 era. And also, I'm making good progress on the TAC retrospective. That one's just a slow but sure process because of how many games I have to play for that one. Gee, willikers. I think that's it though. Just uh, stay tuned if you're so inclined. I would love for you to stick around. But anyway, I appreciate you for watching. So thanks for stopping by and have a great day. <laughs>